without further ado, I would like to introduce John Preskill, our keynote speaker. John is generally regarded as the godfather, or at least one of the godfathers of quantum computing. John is the Richard P. Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics at Caltech, and he also runs IQI, the Institute for Quantum Information at Caltech, and he's done that since, I think, 2004. Uh, and if that's not the right year, John will correct me. But we're very, very honored to have John as our keynote speaker today. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. It's all yours. You hear me? Well, thanks very much, Matt. I'm excited to be here and happy to be part of fostering the collaborative spirit of our community. As Matt has said, I'm a theoretical physicist. I have a background in particle physics and cosmology. But for over 20 years, much of my research effort has been directed towards quantum information science. And the way I look at this field is that we are in the early stages now of the exploration of a new frontier of the physical sciences, what we could call the frontier of complexity or the entanglement frontier. This is different from the frontiers we explore in particle physics or cosmology, but like those, it's very fundamental and exciting. We are now acquiring and perfecting the tools to build and control precisely very complex, highly entangled states of many particles. States that are so complex that we can't simulate them with our best digital computers, <laughs> and we can't describe them very well with existing theoretical tools, and that opens opportunities for discovery. For a physicist like me, what's really exciting about quantum computing is that we believe that a quantum computer would be able to efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature, which isn't true for classical, that is, non-quantum digital computing, which can't simulate highly entangled quantum systems. So that means that we would be able to probe more deeply into the properties of complex molecules and exotic materials and also explore fundamental physics in new ways. For example, the properties of elementary particles or the quantum behavior of a black hole or the evolution of the universe right after the Big Bang. And our confidence that this is an exciting frontier to explore rests largely on two principles. Quantum complexity, which is our basis for thinking that quantum computing is powerful, and quantum error correction, which is our basis for thinking that quantum computers can really be scalable to large devices which can solve hard problems which would otherwise be out of reach. And what underlies both of these principles is the idea of quantum entanglement. That's the word that we use for the characteristic correlations among parts of a quantum system which are different from correlations that we encounter in everyday life. You can think of it this way. We can imagine a system with many parts. Let's say it's a book which is 100 pages long. And if this is an ordinary classical book, then every time you read another page, you learn another 1% of the content of the book. And after you've read all the pages one by one, you know everything that's in the book. But if instead it's a quantum book where the pages are very highly entangled with one another, then when you look at the pages one at a time, you just see random gibberish. And after you've read all the pages one by one, you know very little of the content of the book. And that's because information isn't imprinted on the individual pages. It's encoded almost entirely in how those pages are correlated with one another. If you want to read the book, you have to make a collective observation on many pages at once. That's quantum entanglement. And it's different from notions of information that we're familiar with. To build entangled systems, we have to use as our fundamental components, not ordinary bits, but quantum bits, what we call qubits. And there are a lot of different ways in which a qubit can be realized physically. A qubit can be encoded in uh, an elementary particle, like a photon, a particle of light, or a single electron. It can be carried by a single atom. And after many years of effort, we've learned to control qubits that are encoded in that way 
fairly accurately. It can also be a more complex system like a superconducting circuit involving the collective motion of many electrons. And when we speak of quantum complexity, what we have in mind is that if we wanted to describe a typical, very highly entangled system of just a few hundred qubits, to describe all the correlations among the qubits completely would require that we write down a number of bits, which is larger than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So it will never be possible to write such a description down. And that opens the possibility that by processing qubits, we can perform tasks that wouldn't be possible from processing bits. Now, that in itself doesn't necessarily mean that quantum computers are powerful. We have three kinds of arguments for thinking that quantum computers can do things which would be out of reach with classical computing. One is that we know of problems which are believed to be hard for classical computers, but theoretically, quantum computers would be able to solve these problems easily. The best known example is the problem of finding the prime factors of a large composite integer. And we think factoring is hard because many smart people have tried for many decades to find better factoring algorithms and haven't succeeded. We also have arguments from the theoretical computer scientists based on complexity theory showing that under reasonable assumptions, a quantum state that can be prepared fairly easily with a quantum computer has the feature that if we measure all the qubits, we are sampling from a correlated probability distribution that can't be sampled from by any efficient classical means, indicating that the quantum computer is doing things that surpass what we can do classically. But the most important argument we have that quantum computing is powerful probably is that we don't know how to simulate a quantum computer using a digital computer. And that's true even after many decades of effort by physicists to find better ways of simulating quantum systems. But the power of a quantum computer is not unlimited. Uh, we don't expect, for example, that a quantum computer will be able to efficiently solve the hard instances of NP-hard problems like the traveling salesman problem. It's a remarkable thing, though, that I think it's one of the most amazing things I've heard in my scientific career, that there's a distinction between problems that are hard classically and problems that are hard quantumly. And it's a compelling problem to try to understand better what are the problems in this intermediate regime which are classically hard, but quantumly easy. And for a physicist seeking such problems, the natural place to look is the problem of simulating a quantum system involving many particles. Some years ago, two great physicists, Bob Laughlin and David Pines, put it this way. They said that we really have a theory of everything that's relevant to ordinary life. We have high confidence that that theory is correct, and we can write down the equations precisely. They are the equations that describe how atomic nuclei and electrons interact electromagnetically. But we can't solve those equations. And so, as they put it, we have a theory of any, everything only to discover that it has revealed exactly nothing about many things of great importance. And those things of importance that they had in mind are situations in the quantum world where entanglement is important. And they put it boldly by saying, no computer existing or that will ever exist can break this barrier of solving the equations describing many entangled particles. But in fact, years before they raised this point, the physicist Richard Feynman had articulated a rebuttal. As he put it, nature isn't classical, damn it, and if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical, and by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. Feynman envisioned using a quantum computer to solve the quantum physics problems that physicists and chemists are interested in, and Pines and Laughlin knew he had made this proposal years earlier, but they dismissed it as an impractical idea. And in fact, it's been 35 years since Feynman made this proposal, and we're only now reaching the stage where quantum computers can begin to give us 
interesting information about hard quantum problems. So why is it taking so long? What is it about quantum computing that's so hard? Well, largely it stems from a fundamental feature of the quantum world that we can't observe a quantum system without producing some uncontrollable disturbance in the system. And that means if I want to use a quantum system to store and reliably process information, then I need to keep that system nearly perfectly isolated from the outside world. But at the same time, I want the qubits to strongly interact with one another so I can process the information and we want to be able to control the system from the outside and eventually read out the qubits so that we can find the result of a computation. And it's very hard to build a quantum system that satisfies all of these desiderata and it's taken many years of developments and materials and control and fabrication to get where we are now. Eventually we expect to be able to protect quantum systems and scale up quantum computers using the principle of quantum error correction. The essential deal, idea of quantum error correction is that if we want to protect a quantum system from damage then we should encode it in a very highly entangled state which like that 100 page book has the property that when the environment interacts with the parts of the system one at a time it can glimpse essentially none of the information that's stored in the device and therefore can't damage it and we've understood in principle how to reliably process information that's stored in that very highly entangled way but there's a significant overhead cost for doing quantum error correction in order to write the information in this very highly entangled book we need many extra physical qubits and so that's not going to happen for a while. Where we are now is that we are just embarking on a new era in quantum technology. I wanted to have a name for it in this talk so I made up a word which is NISC. It stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum and the intermediate scale refers to the fact that we expect in the next couple of years to have quantum computers with 50 or more qubits, that's a significant milestone because it's enough qubits so that we can't by brute force simulate what's happening in the quantum computer using the most powerful existing digital supercomputers. Noisy emphasizes that we'll have imperfect control over those qubits and that noise will place serious limitations on what we'll be able to do in the near term. Now physicists are very excited about this NISC technology. It gives us a new tool for exploring the physics of many entangled particles and it might have useful applications that many of you care about but we're not sure about that. We shouldn't think that NISC is going to change the world by itself. It should be regarded as a step towards a more powerful quantum technology that we'll be able to develop in the future. I do think that there will be transformative effects on society of quantum computers eventually, but that may still be decades away. We're just not sure how long it's going to take. I've emphasized the number of qubits as a way of characterizing how difficult it is to do the simulation on a classical device of a quantum computer. But the number of qubits isn't the only thing we care about. We also care about the quality of the qubits and in particular the accuracy with which we can perform quantum gates, operations well controlled that act on pairs of qubits in an entangling way. And with the best hardware we have now in trapped ions or superconducting circuits, the error rate per gate for two qubit gates is at about the one in a thousand level and we don't actually know whether that error rate can be maintained in larger devices with many qubits but we'll be finding that out soon. So naively and as I'll say later it might be too naive, we with these noisy devices don't expect to be able to execute a circuit with many more than a thousand gates, a thousand fundamental two qubit operations and that's going to limit the computational power of NIST technology. Eventually we'll do better. We'll be able to use quantum error correction to scale up quantum computing further but as I've said there's a heavy overhead cost both in number of qubits and number of gates for doing quantum error correction so that's probably not going to happen very soon. 
There are other things we care about too, like the time it takes to execute a gate. For example, superconducting circuits are much faster than ion trap quantum processors. We care about the connectivity among the qubits, how reliably we can fabricate them, and other things. There are some very interesting and important aspects of quantum technology that I'm really not going to talk about, but I'll mention them so you know I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> One of those is the impact that we can foresee the disruptive effect of quantum computers on the way we protect our privacy. The public key crypto systems that are in widespread use today will become obsolete in the years ahead because they can be easily broken by sufficiently powerful quantum computers. And so we should be thinking now about how we're going to protect our privacy in the future. One possible way is to replace our existing crypto systems with new ones which we're confident are resistant to attack by quantum computers. Another possible way is to use quantum information, traveling qubits, most likely photons, to create shared keys that can be used for encryption, that's based on the principle that you can't eavesdrop on quantum communication without producing a detectable disturbance. But we have a ways to go before we'll have the technology that can distribute quantum entanglement and key around the world. That's another interesting technological challenge. A quantum network could also be used for other purposes like sharing information among quantum devices. Quantum technology also has advantages for some kinds of sensing. They can sense weak forces. Quantum systems can sense weak forces with better sensitivity and spatial resolution than other sensing technologies. And that could have relatively near-term important applications, for example, to medicine. Some of the same technological developments that will advance quantum communication and networking and sensing are also relevant to quantum computing. But that's not the thing I wanted to focus on. I wanted to talk mainly about whether, especially in the near term, we can use quantum computers to speed up the solutions to hard problems, in particular applications that would find widespread use. So when we speak of quantum speed ups, depending on the type of situation we're talking about, to be fair, we should make a comparison with the best classical systems, the best hardware, running the best algorithms that perform the same task, uh, not just today's technology, but the classical technology we can foresee a few years ahead. And we should also keep in mind that because of imperfect control, it may be for some problems, like the quantum simulation problems that physicists are especially interested in, it may be hard to validate that a quantum computer is really giving the right answer, so it's important to continue to think about how to find better methods for verifying the output of a quantum computer. Arguably, we might be interested in quantum technology even if there are supercomputers that can compete for time to solution if the quantum hardware, say, has lower cost and lower power consumption. Now, as I emphasized, we don't expect quantum computers to be able to efficiently solve worst-case instances of NP-hard problems, like combinatorial optimization problems, but it's possible that they'll be able to find better approximate solutions or find such approximate solutions faster, and that would also have important implications. Whether we'll be able to do that with NIST technology, we don't know, but we can try it and see if it works. There's a kind of emerging paradigm about how to use near-term quantum technology for optimization, which is a kind of hybrid quantum classical algorithm where a quantum processor prepares a state, we measure all the qubits, we process the measurement outcomes using a classical optimizer that alters slightly the way the quantum state is performed, and then the cycle is repeated until convergence. And if we apply that to solving some kind of combinatorial optimization problem, it goes by the name the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. But it can also be applied to quantum problems like trying to find low energy states of complex systems like relatively large molecules, in which case it goes by the name the variational quantum eigensolver. So will we be able with NIST technology to improve this type of optimization problem through these hybrid classical 
quantum algorithms? Nobody knows, but we're going to try it and see how well we do. It's an ambitious goal because the classical methods that we use to solve these problems are well honed after decades of development. The history of classical computing teaches us that when hardware becomes available, that can stimulate and accelerate the development of new algorithms, and we can anticipate that that's going to happen with quantum computers as well. There are lots of examples of this in classical computing, where heuristics are discovered and work better than theorists can initially explain. For example, with the simplex method for linear programming, which was eventually uh, shown to be a good algorithm by theorists long after it had experimentally been shown to be useful. A uh, current example is deep learning, where we don't really have good theoretical explanations for why deep learning works as well as it does. So in the quantum case also, we're going to experiment and perhaps discover new heuristics, which initially we won't be able to explain how well they work. And in particular, these optimization methods may work better than we expect. But it is true in the near term that the imperfect gates in NISC systems is going to be a serious limitation on how large a circuit we can run reliably and therefore on computational power. So we really should be thinking about the things that we'll be able to do with the border 100 qubits and with the circuit depth, the number of time steps, which is less than 100, maybe much less than 100. And so it's important to have a vibrant discussion between the quantum algorithm designers and the application users. And as Matt said, an important goal for a meeting like this one is to facilitate and inspire that discussion. Now, I've emphasized 50 to 100 qubits as a coming milestone in quantum technology, but in fact, we have a 2,000 qubit quantum device now, the D-Wave machine. It is not a circuit-based quantum computer. It is what we call a quantum annealer. It uses a different method than execution of a quantum circuit to solve optimization problems, and it solves them successfully. But as of now, we don't have a convincing theoretical argument or persuasive experimental evidence that quantum annealers can really speed up time to solution compared to the best classical hardware running the best algorithms. The situation is a bit nuanced because the quantum annealer is the noisy version with rather poor quality qubits of what we call adiabatic quantum computing. We do have, in the case of noiseless qubits, a theoretical argument that adiabatic quantum computing is powerful, but in, by means of a method that has a high overhead cost, which is different from the way quantum annealers are being used today, and we don't have a good theoretical argument that quantum annealers are scalable, that they will continue to work successfully as we increase problem size using noisy qubits. So far, quantum annealers have been applied mostly in the case of what we call the uh, stochastic mode. What that means is it's relatively easy for a classical computer to simulate what the quantum annealer is doing. But what's coming now, soon, are non-stochastic quantum annealers, which maybe have more promise for achieving speedups over what the best classical algorithms can do. So it's important and will be interesting to continue to experiment with quantum annealers in the next few years, both for solving classical optimization problems and also quantum simulation problems to see how well they can do. So I've emphasized that eventually we're going to use quantum error correction to improve the noise in quantum computers and extend the size of the computations that we can execute reliably. But because of the high overhead cost of quantum error correction, that's not going to be happening for a while. But it's important to be thinking now about how to mitigate the effects of noise in the quantum computations of the NISC era. And naively, you might think that if I have a generic circuit with G gates, a single fault anywhere in the circuit could cause the computation to fail, so we wouldn't be able to execute it reliably if the error per gate is much larger than 1 over g. But that really depends on the problem we're trying to solve and the algorithm that we're using. And in fact, 
for some of the quantum simulation problems that physicists are interested in, there is a natural noise resilience in the quantum circuits that we intend to use. In particular, some of the quantum circuits that we imagine using when we apply the variational quantum eigensolver method to finding low energy states of many particle systems. So there's an opportunity for experimentalists and theorists working together in the next few years to find better ways of making quantum circuits noise resilient so we can extend the computational power using NISC technology. Deep learning is transforming technology and having a big impact on the way we do science as well, so it's natural to wonder about the potential of combining deep learning with quantum technology. It may be that quantum deep learning networks will have advantages over classical ones, for example, in the efficiency of training, but we don't really know. So it's another opportunity to try it and see how well it works. One reason for being hopeful about the potential of quantum machine learning is the potential of what we call QRAM, quantum random access memory. What that means is that we can take a lot of classical data and succinctly represent it using a small number of qubits. So for example, if I have a vector with a large number n of components, there's a way of encoding that vector in just log n qubits, which means potential for significant speedups. But most of the proposals that have been made so far for quantum deep learning are hampered by significant input-output bottlenecks. That is, if I want to apply it to a large classical data set, I have to take into account the cost of encoding the input into QRAM, and that can nullify the potential advantages. And the output is itself a quantum state, which means that in order to get information we can use, we have to measure it, and we can get only a limited amount of information per shot from measuring the state. One thing that's potentially encouraging is that to do quantum deep learning, we won't necessarily need to use general purpose circuit-based quantum computers. It could be a special purpose device, potentially a quantum annealer, if not too noisy. I think the most natural way to think about quantum machine learning as, is as a, a situation in which both the input and the output are quantum states. And so it may have advantages, for example, if we're trying to learn how to control a complex quantum system. In general, we might expect a quantum deep learning network to have advantages over a classical one if it's trying to learn about a probability distribution in which entanglement had a significant role. So that could be quite important for quantum problems. It's not clear what its impact would be for the types of applications of deep learning that are currently being pursued. QRAM, the idea of succinctly representing a large amount of classical data in a relatively small quantum state, also has implications for linear algebra tasks, which we can speed up with a quantum computer. And in particular, the task of matrix inversion, in a sense, is one that allows an exponential speed up, which could have many applications. The algorithm, which we call HHL, after the three authors who discussed it nine years ago, takes as input a succinct representation of a very large matrix, an n by n matrix, which has to be sufficiently sparse and well conditioned, and also as input a vector which is encoded in QRAM, represented succinctly by a small number of qubits. And the output of the algorithm is the result of applying the inverse of that input matrix to the vector in the input stored in QRAM. And compared to classical matrix inversion, there is an exponential speed up. But aside from the caveat that the matrix A has to have special properties, note that both the input and the output are quantum states in this case. On that output, we can perform measurements to learn features of the output. And if we repeat the scheme many times, we can learn more detailed properties about the output. 
But if we're trying to apply this matrix inversion algorithm to classical data, we have to take into account the potential cost of loading the classical data into QRAM, which could nullify the exponential speed up. We do think that this matrix inversion algorithm on a quantum computer is powerful because it's what we call a BQP complete problem. That means that anything that we can solve efficiently with a quantum computer can be encoded as an instance of this matrix inversion problem. And a number of applications have been suggested, for example, to using this matrix inversion algorithm to solve linear classical field equations, for example, to solve the uh, equations of electromagnetism if I'm trying to optimize the design of an antenna. So I think HHL is going to have interesting applications. It's not likely that those are going to be feasible in the NISC era because the algorithm is just too expensive to be done in a device which isn't fault tolerant, that doesn't have error correction. So one arena where we think quantum computers will be quite powerful is quantum simulation, that is studying the properties of what we call strongly correlated, that is highly entangled systems of many particles. And the reason we think that's very hard is that physicists have been trying to do it for uh, many decades and haven't succeeded as Pines and Laughlin were pointing out in the statement I quoted earlier. Quantum computers will be good at this task. They'll be good at simulating many particle quantum systems, even highly entangled ones. And so there's great potential there in the long term to advance chemistry, which might be applied to the design of pharmaceuticals, and to searching for materials with exotic desirable properties, which might be applied to more efficient collection of solar energy or more efficient power transmission, or to finding catalysts that do a better job of catalyzing important chemical reactions, which might be applied to nitrogen fixation, carbon capture, and so on. So there's great potential there, but not likely to be fulfilled in the NISC era because the algorithms needed for these tasks are too expensive to be done without error correction. What classical computers are especially bad at is simulating what we call quantum dynamics. That means predicting how a quantum state will change with time when it's highly entangled. So quantum computers will have a big advantage for that task, and physicists are hoping, hoping to learn interesting things about quantum dynamics using NISC technology in the relatively near term. What might be an instructive analogy is that the theory of classical chaos, that is, the extreme sensitivity to initial conditions in classical dynamical systems that accounts for our inability to predict, predict the weather, more than 10 days out. That theory greatly advanced in the 60s and 70s when it became possible with digital computers to simulate chaotic dynamical systems on computers. And we can anticipate that the ability to simulate chaotic quantum systems, those in which entanglement spreads very rapidly, will advance our understanding of quantum chaos. And that could happen in the relatively near term, even with somewhat noisy devices with of order 100 qubits. So having emphasized simulation of quantum dynamics, I should make a comment about the distinction between analog and digital quantum simulation. When we speak of an analog quantum simulator, what we mean is we have a quantum system with many qubits, and its dynamics resembles the dynamics of a model system that we're trying to study and understand. Whereas a digital quantum simulator is a gate-based universal quantum computer which can be used to simulate any physical system of interest when suitably programmed and also used for other purposes. And in fact, analog quantum simulation has been a very vibrant area of research for the past 15 years. Digital quantum simulation with general purpose quantum computers that are circuit based is, is just now getting started. But some of the same experimental platforms can be used in both guises, both analog and digital quantum simulation, for example, trapped ions and superconducting circuits. These analog quantum simulators are becoming more sophisticated and we're solving or studying more interesting problems with them, but they will be limited by the imperfect control of an analog device. 
they're best suited for studying features that are what physicists call universal. That means relatively robust with respect to introducing some noise or imperfection. But of course, we still want them to be problems that are hard to solve using the best classical digital computers. Eventually, we can anticipate that analog quantum simulation will become obsolete. It will be surpassed by digital quantum simulators, which can be error corrected while analog devices cannot be. That's what happened in classical computing. But then it might, might not happen for a long time, however long it takes us to really get to scalable fault tolerant quantum computers. So when thinking about near term applications, we should keep in mind the potential power of analog quantum simulators. So I've emphasized that we're not going to have error corrected quantum computers solving hard problems for some time, but we can make a lot of progress in the near term in advancing our methods and understanding of quantum error correction. And we can anticipate that in the next few years, we'll see convincingly for the first time that the lifetime and control over a qubit can be enhanced by using quantum error correction, at least at relatively small scales. But to really solve hard problems, using that quantum error correction technique is not going to happen for a while because of the large number of physical qubits needed. Probably to solve really hard problems that involve hundreds or thousands or more of protected qubits, we'll need a number of physical qubits, which is in the millions or more. And that's a very large leap from where we are now with hundreds of qubits. I anticipate we'll get there eventually, but we'll have to cross the quantum chasm from hundreds of qubits to millions of qubits, and that's not going to happen right away. It still will remain important to lower the gate error rates in the various technologies that people are advancing. If we get better quantum gates, that will mean using non-error corrected quantum circuits will be able to go farther by executing larger circuits. And it will also lower the eventual overhead cost of doing quantum error correction when we move on to fault tolerant quantum computing in the future. But it's important to realize that we will need significant advances, not just in systems engineering, but in basic quantum science to attain fully scalable fault tolerant quantum computers. And because we have so far to go, that means that new insights, developments and innovations can substantially alter the outlook for scalability. So that's an important opportunity for basic research and engineering. So one last thing I'd like to suggest as a potential application for quantum computers is quantum games. Physicists often say that the quantum world is very counterintuitive because it's so foreign to ordinary experience, and that's true. But it might be that in the future, kids who have grown up playing games with quantum systems will, through that experience, have a visceral understanding of quantum phenomena like superposition and entanglement that physicists of my generation lack. And quantum games will be a natural opportunity for using quantum machine learning to develop better methods of gameplay in situations where entanglement is highly important. So let me summarize the main points I was trying to get across in the talk. We're about to enter the NISC era, and that's exciting. And we're going to try the NISC technology, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing, to see what it can do. Whether we'll be able to solve useful problems that you care about remains to be seen. We don't know that for sure. We have specific ideas of things we're going to try, like hybrid classical quantum algorithms that can be used to solve optimization problems, both quantum and classical ones. We should be designing quantum algorithms, keeping noise resilience in mind in the near term, even though we won't be using full-blown quantum error correction through clever algorithm design. 
we can extend the reach of the computational power of the NISC devices. Quantum dynamics of very highly entangled systems is especially hard for classical computers to simulate, and so that's a particularly promising arena for quantum computers to have an advantage. We can expect that once we have quantum computers to experiment with, that will accelerate the development of quantum algorithms and perhaps lead to the discovery of new heuristics, which initially we won't be able to understand why they work so well, and eventually, perhaps, theory will catch up. We shouldn't expect NISC in the near term to change the world all by itself. Really, the goal for near-term quantum platforms should be to pave the way for bigger payoffs, which will be realized by quantum devices of the future. We should not lose sight of the importance of continuing to lower gauge error rates. That will lower the overhead cost of quantum error correction when quantum error correction is eventually implemented, but in the nearer term it will extend the reach of what we can do with NIST technologies because it will mean that we can execute larger circuits. The truly transformative quantum technologies of the future are probably going to have to be fault tolerant, incorporate quantum error correction, and because of the very hefty overhead cost involved, that's probably not going to happen for a while, and we don't really know how long it's going to take. But progress towards fault-tolerant quantum computing should continue to be a high priority for the quantum technologists. So, in short, there's a great opportunity in quantum technology, but it's going to take the extended effort of the scientific and te technological community over a long time to fulfill that potential. Okay, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very, very much. You want this? <laughs> okay. So I, I intended to leave time for a few questions. Let's do that. Here's one. Oh, so do we, do we want to get a mic on the uh, person asking the question? Here, we, here comes a mic. Who is? It was, who asked the question? I think it was this fellow. Speaking. Speak into this. <laughs> is this a qubit? Speak right into there. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Joe Raffa with IBM Ventures. Um, is there a notion of a graceful degradation? of fault tolerance? So the question is, is there a notion of a graceful degradation of fault tolerance? Could you explain what the question means? I'm not <laughs> In other words, um, is there a way to get part of the way oh. towards fault tolerance using fewer qubits? Well, um, sure. I mean, fault tolerance is, um, it's not e either you're there or you're not. Right? If you're trying to extend the circuit size that you can execute, then you want to lower the error rate per gate. And the amount by which you can lower the error rate per gate depends on what overhead costs you're willing to pay and also on the performance of the elementary physical gates. So we will, um, for a long time, I think, be in the position of once quantum error correction is used in a serious way of gradually ramping up the circuit size we can execute. Um, I guess that point was missed in my discussion because I, I was trying to say that for a lot of the applications we're most excited about, we'll need a big leap in circuit size and in, um, therefore in logical error rate, and that's what's going to be expensive. Uh, Chris Doran from ARM. Um, if I gave you the choice tomorrow of a 2,000 qubit noiseless adiabatic machine or a 100 qubit noiseless gate based machine, which would you choose? So the question was um, suppose I have this choice, I can either have a noiseless 100 qubit 
a gate-based universal quantum computer, or I could have a 2,000 qubit adiabatic quantum computer, which would I choose? I think I would go with the gate-based computer. Um, now, the, uh, the, so as I mentioned, we can use adiabatic quantum computing when it's noiseless in principle to solve any problem. And that makes use of a mapping of a quantum circuit to the adiabatic algorithm, which is very expensive. So in part, it might depend on you know, exactly what it is I'm interested in doing with a quantum computer. But uh, for myself, I think I would be more excited about the opportunity to explore the things I could do with that 100 qubit um, noiseless machine because of its greater flexibility. So if you look at the quantum error correction here, <laughs> oh, hi. hi John. If you look at the quantum error correction algorithms that are available today, they're all, most of them are all based on the fact that the errors themselves are fully random, you know, either bit flips or, or phase flips. And because of that, you require very high overheads to fully correct something. Do you see any potential to improve the algorithms, maybe take advantage of the fact that the errors are non-random to perhaps come up with error correction algorithms that are more efficient and use less qubits to correct you know, the errors that are likely to happen? Yeah, so the, the question is, can we take advantage of the structure of the noise to improve the efficiency and lower the overhead cost of quantum error correction? And this is a question I thought about a lot and worked on about 10 years ago, in particular for the case of asymmetric noise where, say, phase errors are much stronger than bit flip errors. It's not so simple because um, we need to do more than just store the information reliably in the face of this noise. We need to process it. And the structure of the noise when we propagate it through a gate can change. And so we have to design the gadgets that we use for fault tolerance in a clever way to uh, take advantage of that um, structure. And I think there, there are advantages, but they may not be as transformative as one hopes. Now, I think what people are going to be doing more and more is they're going to apply uh, you know, machine learning methods and other methods uh, to uh, try to improve quantum error correction where theoretically we may not understand so well why, why, why they're working. And, and there's potential because the noise isn't random to find gains there. But I think the theoretical work that's been done so far does not indicate that there will be such impressive gains. Back in the last row. Maybe this is our last question we can take. Yeah. Uh, considering how long it might, considering how long it might be until these machines start doing useful things, uh, do you think that there's potentially a risk that governments, investors might lose interest? So I didn't miss the last part. You said because it might take a long time to do useful things with quantum computers, is there a risk that? Is there a risk that uh, governments and uh, investors might lose interest? Is there a risk that governments and investors might lose interest? Yeah, I'm very concerned about that, um, as I think most of the people working in the field are. And so in thinking about what message I wanted to uh, convey, of course, I don't want to dampen your enthusiasm, and probably I can't. There's nothing, no matter how <laughs> negative I was, you would uh, just be as um, optimistic as before. But I, I do want to... Um, lower expectations about what's going to happen in the, in the near term. Because we, we can't really, if we're going to, to make this happen in a transformative way, we're going to have to stick with it for a long time. 